It is May the 3rd, 2023, and you are listening to yet another episode of Curiously Polar. We are back with another episode, and when I say we, I mean all of us. Everyone's here. <laughs> Mario, Henry, Hello. hi, how are you doing? I'm Chris. <laughs> Oh, you, Chris. Yeah. Ah, Chris. It's been it's been a while. It's been it, a while. Um, indeed, yes. It's been a while because people were traveling to far away polar regions, <laughs> far away polar regions, and then and uh, uh, and, and of then course, to, to the maternity ward, and then yes, to the maternity ward. Henry, <laughs> congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> so hmm. he's he's sleeping right now. Hmm. No, uh, I'm not. <laughs> no, not he. He. <laughs> he is, yeah. He is. The little one. <laughs> ah, yes. Um, so, here we are again with, well, okay, do we have, do we have a... Like a, a title? A, Absolutely. A, 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 a com- a something that combines the topic, something that, like a theme. Do we have a theme? We do have a theme. I think it's bathymetry. Ocean floor topography. Bathymetry. Ocean floor Topography. topography. Basically, I think that's the the combining red line here through all the topics today, uh, which is really kind of, uh, something that's that's really um, interesting for me. I'm I'm really nerdy in that regard. I commissioned a couple of maps uh, very recently, and I love to combine the topography, like the 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 outline of the bedrock, and then having the underwater bedrock as well as a counterpart to that and that's uh, pretty amazing and yeah there are some uh, great projects out there and uh, i think yeah just let's hop into the first topic uh, mapping the ocean floor um the international um, hydrological um, organization has um, a project um which oh, they support a project from gepco and from the nippon uh, science foundation and it's called Seabed 2030, and the uh, Prince of Monaco, Prince Albert II of Monaco, he just announced uh, yesterday that a new area has been added, or uh, a lot of new data has been added, and all data combined um, that has been added to the global map of the seabed is... Uh, twice the size of Argentina, which is kind of a mind-boggling. Is um, it true that the, the I'm, I just I just read that somewhere that we know much more about the moon and other yeah. parts of the solar system than we know about the seafloor? Yeah, and you can actually just put it in numbers. Actually, we know um, very very much likely how the uh, dark side of the moon looks like, or we know more about the surface of Mars than we actually know about the ocean floor and huh. um, the five point. Um, uh, 5.4 million square kilometers that have been added they are now all together um, making 24.9 percent of the seabat of the of the world seabat um so we know less than a third of our seabat of our own planet it's that crazy. gives you an idea how um how, how little we actually know about that and that's make that makes that um, project the seabed uh, 2030 very very interesting because until 2030 in, in 10 years they actually want to map the entire um, seafloor and that's a, a very big undertaking when you see that they actually started in 2017 so the past uh, four years they actually um, mapped less than 30 percent <laughs> so they are like um, a little bit more than 70 or a little, a little bit less than 70 percent um, left on that for yeah seven years yeah but uh when uh, when they started, I mean, if you, there is a, a graph on the Seabed 2030 uh, uh, side uh, web page, and in 2018, only 6.7 percent of the seafloor had been mapped. Yeah. And then we go with a rapid increase: 14.6 in 2019, 19 percent in 2020, 20.6 20. percent in 2021 during the pandemic, and still being able to do that. And then adding 3% again for the next year. So in 2022, and, and we are getting really 
it's it's a huge effort and uh and some areas are more <laughs> are easier than others of course absolutely yeah. and what you also can see is that the uh, level of cooperation has just increased tremendously so the the amount of institutes are actually joining um uh, ciba 2030 uh, is increasing a lot and um yeah we're getting in a lot of new data sets there which gives us a better understanding of how the ocean floor looks like and that is like a very crucial part in understanding also how the flow of the ocean works how ocean currents are actually working how they are influencing weather patterns and so on and so forth so to actually understand better what's going on on our planet we need to know um how those things are uh, interconnected how they're working with each other and for that we need to understand how the uh, the seafloor looks like yeah. so yeah. do we uh, I'm, I'm just interested in how this works so is it mostly echolocation from from ships or are there more i don't know underwater drones now that do that or how how do we actually acquire this data I'm not sure if they're actually drones um, in use at that. Um, as far as I know, it's ships actually doing the job still. Okay. There are also satellites um, doing parts of the job, but obviously satellites penetrating that far um, down is yeah. much more difficult. So the, the resolution is not that precise. So the ships are actually still doing the major part. It's, right. uh, it's actually uh, a very... I mean, quite a complicated thing because you have, it's not just about any ship with any echo sounder, yeah. even even a very powerful echo sounder. They have to be calibrated and recognized as instruments that are reliable and uh, approved for, for this sort of, uh, this sort of bathymetry. And also the, the satellite images are, or the satellite uh, uh, data is recorded also on the basis of what kind of waves and how the waves are breaking on the surface. So there are ways of inferring to a certain degree what kind of underwater topography there is by looking at the wave patterns and how the wave pattern actually moves about so as to be able to focus the ship effort on the areas that are more interesting. Because, of course, a deep abyssal plane at 3,000 meter depth is that has no prominent features is uh, relatively i mean it could be very interesting as well for other reasons but it's uh, it's less urgent to map rather than see mounds where there is an a an uh, a wealth of life that can they can live on a on a on a sea mound more than on the depths of the ocean. Well, I the depths of the ocean might be interesting for mineral nodules or I suggest like to get to get Google involved because they have street view and they could have like a water view, sea view thing that cause they, they they'll pull it off with AI they and probably stuff, pull it off, right? yeah. And and that would be that would be great. I mean having like rovers that are independent yeah. rovers that are going down on the bottom of the seafloor and then like checking out what's what's going on in there talking to each other have you seen this area no then let me go there you know this yeah. kind of stuff it's that would be great but what's interesting there is um mario said that uh abyssal planes with um almost no features in there and what this new set of data actually provided is uh, a better knowledge or a more detailed knowledge of those kind of areas and um in that uh new set 19,000 newly discovered undersea volcanoes have been just published. 19,000 volcanoes we did not know about on the bottom of the ocean. Hmm. So those are the kind of features that need to be discovered uh, to understand actually what's going on. And uh, that's pretty pretty amazing. The paper reads really, really exciting. So yeah. I'm certainly going to link that in the show notes. And they do, and they do have in this project. They do have also the crowdsourcing. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not excluding with what I said before. I'm not excluding the data from normal instrument, like not approved uh, hydrographic uh, surveys, is is not useful. It's the same with like with satellites. I mean, it is important to know more or less what's underneath and this is what we see also in the ships that are going that Henry and I have been working on uh, they have a system called Gebco uh, called Gebco sorry <laughs> uh, the uh, the, the uh, yeah it's uh, it's a it's a very uh, interesting crowdsourcing of the data that the uh, that the actual 
companies or the ship can use but also can share with others and if one trusts the other ships then one has the the extra bathymetry for areas where the bathymetry is not detailed you can also launch a zodiac for uh, with the, with these instruments installed on and and do uh, a bathymetric surveys of a bay where the data is very scarce and uh, and, uh, and and this is the power of, of crowdsourcing, of course, and that's yeah, particularly fantastic. In, the, in yeah. the areas we are traveling to, um, there's very little known in, in, in a lot of those mm -hmm. areas. And we've done that a couple of times, and I remember that in, in Greenland, we've done that, in Antarctica, we've done that, in uh, the Northwest Passage. Uh, yeah. When when you go uh, last year, when, when we went in, uh, into the north with Le Commandant Chaco, there's very little information about um, the, the depth of the ocean there. So you're just sending out zodiacs mm -hmm. and you just try to, to sound a little bit ahead of you and just uh, get an idea. Can the ship go or not? Yeah, yeah and, uh, and we did it uh, quite, uh, quite much now in, in January, February on the National Geographic Resolution. We had the nice. zodiac out and uh, especially around Ross Island, Oh, right. uh, like several bays that have been mapped there and, uh, and a few other small areas. Like, for example, the area down on the, the Larsen A, uh, we went in there and now there is no more Larsen A shelf. Yeah. And uh, well, it was just uh, just for fun launching the zodiac and and trying to see what's underneath and and checking out i mean of course it was quite flat and and deep but uh but it was still interesting to have that piece of the puzzle absolutely cool mm -hmm. all right um next topic is one that i came across recently so th let me let me preface this by what my mental model was of how those ocean currents work you know you you've seen these these graphics with like okay there's a big current going from here to there and there's a big current it's like i don't know maybe five to ten different big streams moving around at least in my in my perception and uh, then i came across fesom or fesom or fesom um, which stands for finite element volume sea ice ocean model and <laughs> it's um a mouthful it's it's yeah <laughs> and it's it's been developed by researchers at the alfred wegner institute in germany it uses some very very interesting meshes and methods to mm. get uh, this information at a very good resolution mm. uh, it's dynamic so you can actually mm. see how those different streams move and it turns out that this is not exactly uh, as i imagined that because um here's here's those the the the, the sea eddies which mm. are in this case around uh, Antarctica, and um, if you don't, if you don't watch this on video, this is where you want to switch or follow the link in the show notes to mm. get uh, to the video that we're playing right now, because there is an enormous granularity of different streams and different swirls. We're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different. Uh, sea currents moving some of them just going in circles some of them I mean it looks amazing and mm. this goes into weather models and other things or in climate models more precisely um, there's different versions of it there's there's different granularities of it and I'm just I'm just blown away by the detail here and my, my, my entire worldview is challenged now <laughs> yeah and i think uh, that the uh, the power of this model is that you can uh, you can increase the resolution by zooming in it's not a fixed resolution yeah uh, you, you can not in the video here but you can yeah. in the in the actual model it's it turns out to be like very very detailed yeah no, it's uh I said it's a really uh, it's a really great uh, model to and it's mesmerizing to look at yeah, it's, it's yeah, hypnotic it I, I could I could keep this on a loop and just yes it's a nice yeah. screensaver yeah. <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> Well, there are tools yeah. out there, actually, which are facilitating uh, those kind of data, which give you in the field some idea of um, upcoming weather fronts, for example, uh, where things are um, yeah, just centering or focusing around. And um, I really appreciate that you nowadays have almost real-time data on those kind of events, and that's pretty awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, the other the other power of this model is that it includes a uh, like a CI uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, implementation that is not right. just based on the fact that part of the ocean is just covered by sea ice, but also by how thick the sea ice is. Right. In so different fee, areas. fee sum is the mm. ocean model, and then fee sim is the ice model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And and you have a, a like a a plugin into the fee sum two that is with the the parameterizes the ice pack that is uh, that is very it's very very important especially now that uh, I mean recently uh, I think it was uh, at the end of February that uh, or March that uh, some of the colleagues here at the Norwegian Polar Institutes have uh, published in Nature a paper about uh, the roughness of the polar ice in the north and uh, how it's getting younger and how it's getting thinner yeah i think that these uh, models will have to accommodate for the ice getting getting thinner and uh, and and therefore more brittle and and more flexible so that the waves actually can travel under the ice and break it up and that's also a positive feedback loop. Um, yeah. uh, the thicker the ice is, the less likely um, the creation of big hurricanes, for example, is. And the more hurricanes you have, the more likely it is that the thinner sea ice is actually breaking up, creating more hurricanes breaking up the more thinner sea ice. So, yeah, that's um, all interconnected again. Yes. Yes. All right. Let's get to the main topic of today. A In waterfall. A waterfall, exactly, and it's just like a little one, <laughs> just a tiny one, <laughs> a very little one, um, the largest one in the world. And everyone wants to see it, and you know, everyone wants to go there. But when you're actually in the area, you don't see a dang thing, and you exactly. want to get out of there. You see, you see <laughs> a very usually rough. You want to get out of there. <laughs> When we talk about the Drake Passage under the south, um, the counterpart in the north is Denmark Strait between um, Iceland and Greenland. And down there you have um, a big current coming down, actually, from uh, the Arctic Ocean, coming down the, the East Greenland Current, all the way from the uh, deep sea basin um, through mm. the rather deep Fram Strait. And then it's passing through the area between um, Greenland and Iceland. And we have the uh, Greenland-Iceland rise in there because actually Iceland and Greenland geologically, at least in that area, are interconnected or created by the same mantle plume and then separated by the opening of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. But there we have rather shallow waters. And that is one of the main reasons why this large waterfall is happening there underwater. We have different densities uh, of cold and warm water and mm -hmm. just right um, to the yeah, west of Iceland, actually, the water suddenly just uh, drops from around 500 meters to 3,500 meters depth. And that's just something absolutely incredible. Thinking about those numbers, there's three kilometers drop. That's just something uh, that dwarfs any waterfall on planet Earth that is accessible. And when you think about, um, what is it, uh, Niagara Falls or uh, Victoria yeah. Falls, uh, nowhere near yeah, it's uh, three kilometers, five uh, five million cubic meters per second. Is, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot. Uh, it's one of those numbers you even can't even comprehend. It's just something <laughs> really uh, difficult. How wide is it? I mean, I mean now we know how high it is, but how wide is it? It's forty kilometers, if I remember mm. that correctly. <sighs> yeah, so don't don't quote like me so. on that. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, yeah. It says like. Uh, 12 times more than Victoria Falls, where the Guiara Falls in Brazil, and that was, uh, this is 350 times the largest waterfall above the sea level, let's say, <laughs> like uh, the largest so uh, freshwater waterfall. Is it just temperature making this uh, take place? Is it different, I don't know, saltiness? Is it... What are the things that make so this The salinity waterfall? is part of the temperature, right? Um, yeah, it's saltiness. It's saltiness. Yeah, that's the technical yes. term, saltiness, yeah. not salinity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> saltiness. <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's a density. It's both the uh, it's both the temperature and the um, and the uh, saltiness of the uh, of the water that uh, takes it down. So it's the uh, <laughs> it's the uh, global thermohaline circulation that is passing there and that's um connected with the 
bathymetry with the topography of the bedrock down there. And when the very dense cold water at the bottom just reaches over that uh, sill of the um, Greenland-Iceland mm. connection and it drops down, then because it is so much heavier than the slightly warmer water of the Erminger Sea, which is uh, in the south southeast of Greenland, um, then it just drops down there and creates a humongous uh, downdrift there. And that is one of the main drivers of that um, circulation in the ocean floor. And that's, uh, yeah, mm. just one of the reasons why we need to understand the bathymetry even better that we actually can see um, how this magic unfolds entirely on the planet. And, and also like the formation of the polar ice and the decrease in the formation of the polar ice is is going to influence or is already influencing this global yeah. thermal line situation circulation because you have the surface water if you imagine in the north atlantic you have the the uh what we popularly call the gulf stream that pushes surface warmer water to the polar area then once the water gets to the polar area sea ice should form normally would form and as the sea ice forms the area the 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 water becomes colder of course but uh, because otherwise the sea ice wouldn't form but also the it becomes also saltier because the sea ice would preferably form with a lower salinity than the seawater around so the seawater gets colder and saltier and falls to the bottom and then creates this this currents going further south along the for example the east greenland um, coast but as if the sea ice doesn't form for example in a situation where sea ice is forming less then there is less salinity and less like the temperature is higher in the water so this this circulation would be slower and then the the capacity of the ocean to redistribute the heat that is absorbing from the atmosphere is going to be diminished and this is what we are seeing now with the ocean being extremely warm and not being able to absorb more heat practically so i'm curious does this have any impact on marine wildlife I mean, would 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 I don't know? Fish use this as a as a fast track elevator down to the depth and stuff like that. Well, it's more it's more that the, the uh, there is something called the borealization of uh, marine species uh, in the northern hemisphere, and uh, in the North Atlantic, species are moving north. I mean, you find uh, uh, that you have tuna now returning to. I mean, apart from the tuna population in the North Atlantic becoming more populous because of relatively good management of the fisheries but you have tuna coming up to the latitude of bergen in in norway between norway and iceland oh because because the the south the southern Bec more southern waters are not uh, as hospitable to and them not, anymore. yeah bec because they have the possibility of coming yeah. out there because their prey is coming north I mean, we have seen it uh, about 10 years right. ago that the mackerel is doing strange migrations that were not possible before i mean they were not doing before and we have found like was it two years Years ago, there was a, a leatherback turtle observed around the Lofoten area. So we are coming up into the Arctic Circle, a, a sea turtle, which is not not saying that the water is getting warm just because you see a sea turtle, but uh, but it, it means that like it is possible to have a live sea turtle up in 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 the polar area if you're talking right. about coming up north uh, of the of the Arctic Circle. And uh, and and uh, the limit to the north of this, if you are thinking about, it, I mean, the cod, for example, in Norway comes up to the Barents Sea, and you have the this wonderful cod that is fished in January, February in the Lofoten. Uh, this is a Barents Sea cod. Uh, this cod would then find that the water is too warm, and they would try to move north, north of the Barents Sea. But north of the Barents Sea, then you come into the polar basin, which is deep, and that's not the habitat for cod. So the limit to the movement northwards is is also also the sea bottom topography because uh, like some fish need to have a sea bottom not too deep <laughs> like if you're thinking about the barren sea is not a very right. deep sea and this is where we have the uh, uh, the, uh, the the limit to the north of uh, of the expansion of of cod for example 
and that goes also for other species when you think about uh the big pinny pads like uh walrus um it needs shallow waters to feed and if the food source travels further north um it's not that shallow anymore it can't feed that long so there there are a lot of implications uh with that yeah. regard absolutely yeah even though i don't know if you saw it but there was a uh, christian luderson and colleagues here at the polar institute that have uh, had a recording of a walrus 25 kilometers uh, from the north pole trying oh, to wow. play with one of those oceanographic <laughs> stations that they had there so it was uh, quite an interesting <laughs> like with photos and everything it was, uh, pretty, pretty yeah interesting. We'll, we haven't seen any there <laughs> we will see more interesting sightings yeah. of our yeah. the next decades for sure. a couple of polar bears around the, at the north pole very regular actually yeah, mm. and uh, I mean, polar bears and polar bears, even with cubs, have been observed all yeah. through the Central Arctic Ocean. But uh, are they stationary? Are they passing by? And what is going to happen to them when the ice in the summer is not going to be stable enough for them to wander about? Exactly. Okay, yeah. how, how do we manage to get back to the waterfall from here? Okay, let's get back to the waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> Hard segue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. uh, it's my job. It's the organizing is my job. Um, mm. Anyway, so. As we, as we can see, everything is interconnected. It makes it so difficult yes. to stay on one mm. topic. <laughs> it's very true, very true. Mm. Especially as we haven't seen each other for so long. Yeah. Uh -huh, lots of catching up to do. Um, with yeah. that, I guess we have an episode under our belt um, about topography oceans and the stuff that we don't know much about but that we know more and more about how about that mm -hmm. all right um that brings us to the end of this episode henry mario thank you so much for your time <laughs> you're and, uh, welcome thank you chris for organizing are, all of this <laughs> we are going to uh record a few more over the next week so there should be more content on curiouslypolar.com you can find us online also on the twitters and uh yeah we'll be back soonish until then everyone take care and bye-bye <laughs>